Thank you everyone for attending the American Medical Association's Women in Medicine uh, webinar, Women Physicians Leading During Crisis. My name is Dr. Anita Ravi. I'm the Vice Chair of the AMA Women Physicians section and your moderator for today. On behalf of the AMA WPS, I am honored to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Renee Critchlow is the Director of Advocacy and Policy for the University of Minnesota Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. Dr. Critchlow also serves as an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota's Department of Family Medicine and Community Health in North Minneapolis at the University of Minnesota North Memorial Family Medicine Residency Program. She's recently been appointed to the Mac Baird Endowed Chair in Family Medicine Advocacy and Policy. Our distinguished presenter currently holds a number of other key positions, including serving on the American Academy of Family Physicians Commission on Federal and State Policy, and serving on the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine Board of Directors. She's also the Director of Advocacy and Policy for the University of Minnesota's Department of Family Medicine and Community Health. In addition, Dr. Critchlow is the founding physician for the Eastern Montana Area Health Education Centers and one of the founding members of the latter, a cascading mentorship program in North Minneapolis intended to help youth from low-income communities pursue medical careers. It's with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Critchlow to share her insights on leadership during crisis. Thank you and take it away, Dr. Critchlow. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Totally appreciate it. Good to see you again. Totally appreciate it. And thanks to the AMA for the invitation to the Women in Medicine uh, webinar. I've been asked to talk about leading in 2020. And as a lot of you know, as physicians, we have many different leadership levels and responsibilities. And 2020 has been probably the most challenging career year of all of our lives. The convergence of COVID-19, structural racism, gender inequity, climate change, wildfires, murder hornets, and it's going on and on. And each day, each week, we don't know what's next. Learning objectives we've been asked to discuss are as follows. Biggest thing though is, this is me, and generally I just tell stories. And this year there's a lot of stories to be told. Leading in crisis. First you have to understand what is crisis. I think this is one of the best definitions when it comes to leadership and addressing crisis. It's a time when difficult important decisions must be made. And a lot of times it has to be made with not fully informed choices but the decision still had to be made. So I think one of the biggest things that I've come to understand is that we sort of have to have guiding principles when we're making decisions. It helps us stay on our path. And why Sage once said, the world stands on three pillars, reality, self-emptying, meditation, and acts of loving kindness. And when I don't know what direction to go, these are the principles that guide me leading in crisis. Everyone has their own way of addressing it. Everyone has their own way of dealing with it. For me, it sort of breaks down to the must acknowledge, must activate, and must advise. And you must do this in many different ways from many different perspectives. We're gonna walk through 2020 from my perspective. And as a physician, as a physician leader, as a mom, as a underrepresented person in medicine as a black woman in the society. So many things have converged. 2020 has really helped us understand what's essential and what's most problematic. So first, acknowledge. We have to understand the urgency, even if we don't have the full situation, because the situation is going to happen whether or not we fully understand it or not. So, Rewind back to December 2019. I remember hearing about things in the news and this paper came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I dove very deeply into this because it was very concerning to me that this would be the possible next pandemic. When I was uh, a few years back, I remember when we were all training for Ebola. I remember going into work and learning how to don and doff PPE, learning what the words don and doff meant, these kinds of things. 
how to safely deal with a hemorrhagic disease that was contagious. It was frightening, but we started preparing early. And I think that that was really important. So when I saw the novel coronavirus happening in China, and we were getting data out of it about the possibility of how it might spread, I started paying much closer attention. By really odd coincidence, in March of that year, 2020, I was at a class at the Harvard Kennedy School and executive education, I highly recommend those classes. I don't have any economic attachment to them. I have a deep personal attachment to them because I've learned a lot there. Class we were taking at the beginning of March, crisis leadership in higher education. They gave us a lot of advanced reading and we were all prepared to do a lot of case studies and multiple different crises and how to approach it when leading in higher education. All that came to a grinding halt. At one point, our professors uh, gave us an early break and went off to be advised and be advising regarding a new uh, crisis that was likely coming to our country. Remember when our professor came back, he drew this on the board. It's the first time I ever saw it. It's the first week of March. And he was talking about what was coming and how we need to be prepared. He was looking at these curves and talking about this line. He said, the y-axis here is the number of potential cases from the novel coronavirus, SARS, to one we call COVID-19 more often than not. And he's like, this line, this curve here, that's what could happen if we don't do anything. That's how many cases can happen and that's how quickly. And he's like, this line here, this line here represents the capacity of the health systems to deal with the cases. Number of beds, number of ventilators, number of, of staffing available, even properly um, PPE available through staff. How would we be prepared? This line is the, is the level we were prepared to deal with. And he started talking about this curve. This curve would be what would happen if we could mitigate the spread. If we could slow the spread of the coronavirus, then we would have a chance so that our health systems wouldn't be overwhelmed. I remember he went up on the board and he drew this. And I was like, I didn't realize how many times I would see this image in how many different ways. But I knew it was something that we definitely had to think about because it wasn't gonna go away. And if we didn't think about it, this is what would be, we would be dealing with. So the next week after that class was the last trip I took with my son for a very long time. Um, we went down to visit my brother and his uncle in Austin, Texas, and we had a great time. But in my head, I kept knowing that there were big things coming. It was almost like you could hear like a semi truck or a train just approaching. Something big was coming, coming and we had to be prepared. And it's interesting, when you lead at many different levels, um, I mean, at that point I was president of the Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians, uh, largest single specialty physician organization in the state of Minnesota. I was in the position I currently hold also is on the executive team for our department in, in the, as a director of advocacy and policy. I was a practicing, and still am a practicing full spectrum family doctor. I do outpatient, inpatient, I do obstetrics, the whole gamut. And we teach, we teach learners from, um, especially with our mentorship organization, we teach learners starting at nine years old. We teach undergrads, we teach medical students, we teach physicians, resident physicians. And at all these different levels, there's some way that we lead. It's one of the things as physicians, what I tell my learners is, whether you want to or not, as a physician, you are a leader. And as a woman and a mother, we all know that we have multiple obligations. Uh, some of us are right in the sandwich level where we're taking care of our parents and we're taking care of our children and we're taking care of our homes. And as we know, the disproportionate burden of that kind of care rests on women in our society. 
doesn't matter if we're professionals, doesn't matter if we're leaders of national organizations. When we go home, we still have the disproportionate burden of, of the care. It comes with a lot of wonderful things like my son's smile. But in Minnesota, I'm a single mom. Amos, my son, we, have a, we had a great routine. And when we stuck to that routine, everyone got taken care of. And we'd been in it for years. And one of the things that you have to come to realize in crisis is that there's no such thing as routine. And it was one of the things I had to acknowledge to myself was that my family structure would have to change in order for me to be a physician and lead during this crisis. So acknowledge and activate. As a physician leader, activating, you have to think about number one, who you're leading and what's the purpose? Because as leader, you have to define and you have to help define and help shape the vision and you have to basically point the way. This is our purpose because the purpose is what gets us through. Um, I always use too many stories and too many poems in my presentations, so you'll have to forgive me. But purpose, I think, is a critical thing to understand. Um, there was a physician, poet, William Stafford, who wrote this poem. And I wish he would have called it purpose, but he called it the way it is. He says, there's a thread you follow. It goes among the things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder what you're pursuing. You have to explain about the thread. But it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. And for me, purpose is an important part of activating people. And in my position, I felt it very necessary to activate the people I felt the greatest responsibility to, the graduates of our programs, the learners that I teach, my friends and family, my community, and trying to get out ahead of this before it was coming, to sort of set the stage that we are there and we have things to do and we can do it. Not only must we, we can. And when you have a very widespread um, obligation and service, our members were all over the state. A lot of my graduates were all over the country, but we were all gonna be facing a similar issue and I wanted to get them prepared. Social media is the direction I was able to take because I knew that we were going to be isolated, but we were still going to need to be able to connect. <clears throat> One of the first things I wrote um, was actually subsequently turned into a podcast and broadcast around the country. And as I said, forgive me. So this one goes, is for you folks. You know who you are, the grads. I've taught family medicine, physicians, and medical students for more than 20 years. I'm talking to you. We're in the clinics, the hospitals, the emergency rooms, and the ICUs. Remember what I used to tell you. People don't need us when it's easy. They need us when it's hard. Well, it looks like it's going to get hard for a while. And when it does, I want you to remember your training. I don't expect you to be perfect. I don't expect you to know everything. I expect you to do what I do and what we've taught you to do. We step up every time. We do our best. Then we evaluate and adjust as indicated by the results. We expect you to remember as you were trained that these are not cases. These are not admins. These are people. They are your patients. They are someone's daughter, someone's mother, someone's father, someone's son. And we have an, the honor to care for them. It is a sacred duty. There will be times many years from now when they will tell stories of the time of COVID-19. That's not why we're here. No one may ever hear what you've done. Just do your best now. Take care of each other now. Take care of yourself now. Tomorrow is a hope for a better day made real by every choice that we make in the present. You'll need to have faith in yourself, each other, and when you can't believe in yourself, 
remember that I believe in you. Breathe. Much love. Critch. And I kept getting out there. I kept doing the things that I felt was necessary to prepare the people that I was leading and caring for. Every day I woke up and I said, what can we do to help our members today? What do we need to make sure is in place to get us all through this? And I had to make personal choices. I realized that with the unpredictability of the crisis that we were entering, there's no way I could maintain my family's safety. And so within three days of coming back from our vacation, I had to put my son on the plane to go stay with his fathers in Montana because I knew that I would be taking extra hospital shifts. I knew I'd be doing extra OB shifts. I knew I'd have obligations um, within the press, within taking care of our members. I knew that I had no idea how to maintain the structure that it allowed my son and I to be safe and happy before the crisis. I remember driving him to the airport and one of the things he talked about, he's like, he's 12 and he said, um, He's a precocious 12, but he's like, uh, mama, a soul is a very hard thing to define. He said he believes that all animals have souls. He believes the soul is desire to do more than eat and reproduce. A being with a soul has a desire to leave a legacy. And that really hit me. A lot of leadership is you will leave a legacy for good or ill based on the choices you make. And it was heart-wrenching, not going to lie. But I, I knew that I had a duty, and I knew that a lot of my duty was to make sure my son was in the safest place he could be. And I had the privilege of co-parenting with two very wonderful fathers, and I knew he'd be safe with them. And I knew it would give us both the ability to do what we needed to do during the crisis. And also to define what I thought it was about. I've talked about how, you know, the people at the airport may not have understood why I was crying. They may not have understood what was coming. I understood what was coming. So she knows that COVID-19 is not the enemy. It's a virus. The enemy is panic. The enemy is despair. The enemy is greed. These are the things that I will fight every day with every breath. With belief in caring, compassion, courage, and community. And that's one of the things I really wrapped around as the purpose is that we needed to find the values that we considered the best way to get through and caring, compassion, kindness, courage, and community were the ones that I kept hitting on every single day because I felt like it was the only way to counteract the panic, the despair, and greed that we knew were coming. Got out there. It's very fortunate. We have a very good relationship with our media and Early on in March, we started talking about what's possible, what's necessary. Talked about how um, our patients could care for themselves and their family. Uh, talked about sheltering in place. Talked about uh, masking. Talked about um, what was needed. We needed testing. We needed PPE for the entire health system. We needed all of those things as rapidly as possible. And we needed to actually also consider in a big way shutting down so that we could have time to get prepared. Explaining words like social distancing, we never knew that, we never talked about that phrase before, but sort of giving people the concept of what would happen if we could do some of these public health level things, social distancing, masking. And we're at this point early on where we didn't know quite whether it should be every full community masking or just folks who were infected and just folks who were in um, health systems. Everything was changing every week, every day. And during this time, every single leadership position I had, we had to make choices. One of the biggest things we did was very early on, we had to decide whether or not we were going to have our spring annual conference for Minnesota Academy of Family Physicians. And it was, it was, hard because we didn't have a full idea of what was coming. But we had to plan in advance with a limited amount of unconfirmed data. And there was just one point where I remember waking up 
and it, I'd been processing it all night. And I remember getting on the phone and getting on the emails and just saying, we got to call off the conference. Many reasons. Number one, we don't know what, it was a, like two weeks away. We don't know what's coming, but we, we do know is that our members are the physicians that take care of their communities. And right now they need to be in their communities. We're going to cancel the conference. And it's one of those things where when you run an organization, there's an economic impact for every decision you make. That's why you pursue it with your values and your purpose. Our purpose is to care for our members and to care for the communities that they take care of. Canceling the conference was very important. Coolest thing to happen is with all these crises points, we have an opportunity for innovation. Our staff, transitioned over to be able to do a fully remote virtual conference within a few weeks. And that conference is actually available online now. Innovation is necessary during crises, but one of the most important things you have to think about is the idea of you can't predict what's coming. You can only make choices right now and you, you adjust based on what happens. And no regrets in canceling that conference, but it could have gone many different ways. One of the other things we talked about, providing purpose and direction for our members, for the people we lead. Reaching out in uh, electronic form was very important because it was one of the few ways we could get through to everybody. This is one of, we have a, our advocacy uh, blog page. And this was a blog that I wrote called the, the, the Path Through. And it, it went a little viral. We only have 3,000 members and I think this got like 20,000 hits or something crazy like that. And one of the things that it ended with was basically, you know, the choices that each of us made paves the path for, the, for society we are and want to become. Let us plan and prepare, not panic. Let us be there for each other. Let us choose care, compassion, and courage. We can do this, Minnesota. You see this common themes of we have a purpose and we have choices and we shape our future. And it's taking people out of the place of everything is happening to us. It's like we kept hitting on the point that we can do this and we can do this together and that the only way out is through. So one of the things that we were very diligent on and vigilant on was understanding that we had to flatten that curve. We had to make sure that there wasn't a large volume of cases just inundating our healthcare systems. As a state with a lot of family physicians, the majority of our rural communities and a significant amount of our urban community are cared for by our members. And with that kind of diversity of practices, it was very critical that we participate in the decisions that were being made. And we sort of stepped out of our usual comfort zone. In Minnesota, we're not, we're not aggressive people. We're very Minnesota nice. Um, but our organization took the stand actually quite early that we were gonna ask the governor to shut down. We wanted a lockdown, we want a shelter in place so that it would give our communities, our health systems, a chance to get the PPE necessary, get the resources in place where they were necessary, prepare our physicians for what was coming, prepare all of our healthcare systems for what was coming. And we um, actually rather aggressively uh, courted the governor and asking for him to shut down the state. A lot of other physician organizations were working directly with the governor in this regard. And so it wasn't just a one hit wonder, it was a lot of the people pulling together saying, we need a lockdown, we need a shelter in place, executive orders so that we can get prepared for what's coming. And doing this when there was only about 250 cases in the state just was outrageous to some people. They're like, there's hardly anything here. And, but we kept hitting on it. This is coming, we need to prepare, we have to plan. Please give us the time. Uh, about 
four days after we initially had the conversations with the governor, he uh, had a stay at home order. And we started working together to get prepared. And as a lot of you know, we changed the way we delivered health. Telehealth was really important. Um, we changed our hospital into geographic rounding so that there were COVID floors and non-COVID floors. In other parts of our medical system, we just designated full hospitals as COVID-19 hospitals to get the entire staff prepared, put more ventilators, more resources in those areas. And we kept trying to use the resources that we had to encourage and influence increased testing, uh, increased development of PPE. Minnesota is very fortunate and has a large Fortune 500 company manufacturing base. And all those companies were working with the uh, state government and with the universities and Mayo to all sort of get on board that we needed help get ready for what was coming. And the lockdown occurred. This is one of my favorite memes of all time and basically says, and the whole world walked inside, shut their doors and said, we will stop it all, everything to protect our weaker ones, to protect our sicker ones, our older ones. And nothing in the history of humankind ever felt more like love than this. At the beginning, we we're all on the same page. We knew that our community needed to come together. And a lot of that was because the leadership of our state, the leadership of our organizations, and just the history of the people in the state. They work together, they come together. And in crisis, that's one of the things you need. And it happens when you have leaders that are saying this is the way through. They have to be providing the path We had to deal with a lot of things, either memes or social media. And then there's my cat. Um, my Instagram was one of the places where a lot of the younger docs that I work with and learners uh, would come to. And so I tried to make that a place where they could get information in a way that they could hear it. Uh, so this one was, uh, I call this one Sonic Cat. It's still life with social distancing. Sonic Cat, AKA Poe says every time he sees an empty park, he feels the love of our community for each other. He's a very wise cat. He may get some extra catnip. He's not driving anywhere. Flatten the curve, social distancing. We want to try to speak to people in the places and in the language that they can hear. Things change. Things changed everywhere. We got to the point where the majority of people when we're in the lockdown phase, you would drive on the streets, and there would be no one. It would be, I would, I would go, drive to the hospital in the morning and it'd be, you know, empty streets. And at that point, I felt like we were all working together. And when you saw people, they were wearing masks because we knew we all had to be doing this together to make it actually happen. And one of the things as a leader, that I've learned a great deal about is when you provide this kind of purpose, when you provide this kind of support, when you activate folks, ideas flow from directions you'd never imagine. And you, as the, in leadership, you have to be able to say, you know, is this, is this in our plan? Is this within our vision and mission? And can this help us serve the people we need to serve? At one point, our CEO, suggested that we start what's called an echo. For those of you who are not familiar with it, echoes are basically mass Zoom meetings in which you provide information and develop opportunities for case discussions. Uh, the original echo in our state was out of Little Falls, Minnesota, and it was on addiction, um, medic medication-assisted therapy. So providing Suboxone providers around the state the opportunity to gather online 
and discuss uh, suboxone therapy and, the, and their uh, patients that were dealing with medical assisted therapy. Our CEO came and she said to me, she's like, we should do this for COVID. And I remember initially thinking, we don't have the resources to set up an echo. And I, I expressed it, I said, I don't know if we have the resources for that. She goes, let's partner with the people that are already doing it and provide them an opportunity to do this on a different day for COVID for our, our, pay, our, for our providers throughout the state. And primarily we were thinking about folks, especially in the rural part of the state who didn't have access, direct access to you know, MDH experts and the university experts and the Mayo experts. And so um, Mariah Huntley was our CEO for the MAFP and she still is. And she's like, yeah, let's partner with these people. And I thought about it, I was like, yes, that's, that's what you do. In times of crisis, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Let's find out what's already there, see how we can partner and align it with the purposes that we're looking to achieve. So we got to the point where our COVID echo, directed by the folks up in Little Falls, Dr. Eric, Heather Bell and Kurt Devine, we were having twice a week, Tuesdays at lunch and Thursdays at lunch, between 200 and 400 providers from around the state gathering to get information directly from experts. They didn't have to filter it through their Facebook feeds. They didn't have to filter it through the local news or the, or the newspapers. They were getting information directly from the experts because we took the opportunity to partner with people that were already doing something similar and we changed it into the COVID echo and provided hundreds of physicians and clinicians information that they could use at the point of care for both their communities, their clinics, and their patients. As a lot of you know, we all, sh we shifted. This is actually a scene from a dinner party in March. We had to do things in different ways. Um, this is me getting ready to play video games with my son. The last six months or so, we meet up online and we play video games and we talk. And as you know, some younger people have harder times talking directly about their feelings. But when you're playing Minecraft with your son and chopping down trees while he's building ranches, you have an opportunity to talk. And this became a very precious time for me. And as you all know, things just kept dragging on. I think March was the longest month of my entire life. And it got hard. I'm not going to lie. When we're in these positions of leadership, when we're in these positions of care providers, when we're in the positions as physicians, there's so many demands. And it gets challenging. And there were many days where I was just like, oh, well, it's just time to cry because that's the only way that I'm gonna get through this next segment. And that was okay. And I got very deep into meditation because it helped me find a still place. And it was very important because I knew we had a long way to go. And back then we always said, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Right now we realize it's not even a marathon, it's an ultra marathon. And ultra marathons, when people do those, they never run them by themselves. They always have folks that are pacing them. It's not something that we can do alone. And that's one of the things that in leadership that I constantly have to remind myself. It's like, we have help, we have each other. And when, as a leader, if you can express that, and if you can be vulnerable and, and acknowledge that there's times when we all need help, that allows the people around you to do it. And that was a critical part, I think, of that sort of early mid phase was understanding that we were all feeling something, all that uncertainty, all that unpredictability. But we had each other and we had a lot of change that we we're going through. In the hospitals, we got to the point where we were initially, we didn't have enough PPE for everyone to mask. We eventually got there. We started out with social distancing and telemedicine 
and we got to the point where we could do universal masking. And then we got to the point where we actually could do universal PPE. And that was critical because as we examined places that had very high cases and very high number of um, health system members coming down with COVID, it was clear that in the places that had the best PPE for, the, for universally, it decreased the amount of spread. Decreased the amount of spread among the community population, decreased the amount of spread within the hospital, decreased the amount of spread within the providers and the staff. And it became critical, but it took a while until we had the ability to universally do this. We didn't even have the number of face shields to be able to do this universally. So one of the things I realize is that so much of being in crisis is innovating. Anyone in this audience that works in a clinic or hospital knows exactly what these brown paper bags are now. <laughs> Last year, these brown paper bags were the things you put sandwiches in for lunch. This year, they're where you place your PPE so that you can prolong its ability to be useful. When I look at bags like this, when I look at those shields sticking out, when I see those initials on there, I don't even see paper bags anymore. I see people trying to protect their families because when we're in the clinic, when we're in the hospital, we're trying to protect our patients and ourselves and our colleagues and our staff. But the, one of the biggest things you carry in your heart is the idea that I don't want to take this home to my family. I mean, early on, everyone, you wouldn't leave the hospital without scrubbing. You wouldn't leave the hospital in the same shoes that you came in. And in this situation, and when I see those bags, I see someone trying to protect their husband, someone trying to protect their wife, someone trying to protect their children, someone trying to protect their community by not bringing a contagion out of the hospital. Paper bags will never have the same significance to me again. And then came murder hornets. <laughs> it's like when they reviewed 2020, this little episode where giant stinging insects had started to come into common encounters. I was like, yeah, 2020, I'm done, <laughs> done. It's like, what could happen? Murder hornets. I mean, who even thought of that name? And they're huge, they were terrifying. And <laughs> they were also sort of funny in a way because it was just sort of the epitome of the unpredictableness of 2020. When we're gauging with the unpredictableness, one of the things that it did, like I said, kept reaching out on social media, trying to counter um, myths, trying to create positive ways of engagement. And as I did these kinds of things very early on, um, like my Facebook feed is primarily professional. It's my alumni and my grads, uh, folks throughout my academic network, folks throughout my AAFP network and SDFM network, mostly physicians and then friends from high school and college and the community I live in. And I was doing these posts, trying to give people information, trying to give them hope, trying to help them get through. And a few of my grads were like, I wanna do what you're doing. How do I do it? And I was like, okay, I'll write you a primer. And so I sent it out to a bunch of them. And one of the biggest core principles was engage in a positive way, don't have fights, lead by example, lead by model. It's like talking about examples of courage, compassion, kindness, caring, gratitude, inspiration, hope, just trying to inject those things into our society with facts. It's like, we can do this together. And this is the way we get through. And the only way out is through and trying to give them that information so that they can help people in their social circles, in their communities, in their clinics. And it just took off tons of them just started doing this kind of stuff. It's like, I can't tell you how many masked doctors are on uh, are my Facebook feed now. 
and all of them engaging in their communities in many different ways and providing information from someone that people trust. And this was about activation. It's like, you can't do everything yourself. You have to create a way that what you are trying to do can spread everywhere. Uh, my grads back from Montana, my Minnesota grads, all of them engaging and trying to put facts onto the feeds of their communities. Very important because they were personally trusted by the people that they were engaging with. Some of them did, you know, there was humor. It's very important. And humor is a very important quite a way to get things crossed. And in our community, locally, we'd started the echoes for the state. We'd engage with the governor repeatedly. We were engaging uh, with our learners who were the med students. Everything shut down. They were looking for something to do. They were looking for a way to be meaningful and help folks. So one of the things we actually thought of is our patient population. We serve North Minneapolis at the residency program that I'm at. And engaging with that patient population, we realized from the demographics of what was going on with the COVID crisis, they were some of the most vulnerable. They were low wealth, um, primarily African-American uh, and immigrant population, and with multiple chronic illnesses and a lot of challenges, a very resilient and vibrant community and with a lot of challenges. And we're like, how can we best take care of our chronic illness patients? And one of the things we thought of was, let's mask the community that we're living in. And this was prior to any um, statewide mask mandate. We said, we have 10,000 people in this community. How do we get cloth mask on every single person so that it decreases the spread within our community? And one of the things that we did in the same way was join up with people who were doing something already. We um, worked with uh, community organizations that were trying to get this effort started. They were getting uh, neighborhood people to do sewing for masks. There was the African American uh, leadership um, program who was deeply involved and engaging. And so we, uh, as our both uh, the MAFP, our, the program we call the ladder, that's our mentorship program, and our clinic uh, family medicine residency program, we decided let's work together with these folks and let's have a common mission to mask the population that is, we see as most vulnerable within the communities we serve. It gave people something to do, gave them a sense of purpose, and it gave them something that could actually make a difference. So acknowledge, activate, advise. Another wise sage said, the world stands on three pillars, truth, peace, and justice. And when I think about these, they are at my core. And one of the things I realize is that you can't have truth or peace without justice. On May 25th, 2020, George Floyd, 46 year old African American man was killed in Minneapolis. And you have to understand, this is a community that has had multiple killings of African American men by police in the last five years. And it's terrifying to think that someone can kill you with no reason and get away with it unpunished and that it happened repeatedly in our community. So what would you expect to happen? Everyone always talks about in these situations, well, what would Martin Luther King say? Well, Martin Luther King was very clear about what he'd say about civil unrest. He said, riot is the language of the unheard. And when you're in that situation, what you have to, you have to say is like, what is not being heard? In our community, from what I was listening, what wasn't being heard was people were terrified of the fact that when they left their house, they could be killed. When their child left their house, they could be killed. 
You didn't even have to leave your house. Brianna Taylor was killed in her own house, in her own bedroom. And people can kill us as black and brown people and go unpunished. Riot is the language of the unheard. And in Minneapolis, there was riot. This is actually my office. As you can see, this is a picture of my son. This was my office the night after um, there were riots in our neighborhood as a result of the killing of George Floyd. This is what our clinic looked like the next day. We'd been ransacked and looted. There was an attempt to start a fire and we had to decide how we were gonna respond. And we responded in a way that was very clear to us. We understood that number one, there's a difference between protesters and looters. And number two, riot is the language of the unheard. And there was a lot of pain in our community and we were gonna stand by the people we served. And what was amazing about this is um, the day after our clinic was ransacked and looted, a bunch of uh, social activists actually reached out to us on social media and they said, what do you do in that clinic? And we told them we're family medicine physicians. We've been taking care of this neighborhood for over 40 years, for over 45 years. We take care of people, uh, you know, babies. We deliver babies. We take care of kids. We take care of families. We take care of old folks. We take care of the entire spectrum of someone's lives and all the challenges, acute care, chronic care, hospital. We're here to serve our, our neighborhood. And they sent out, they said, no one burns Broadway. And our neighborhood got together and that evening, which is Friday evening, um, they protected the places, they protected our clinic. And we've been able to rebuild since then. But one of the reasons we were able to do that was because we cared about our neighborhood and our neighborhood cared about us. So with every choice, you have to decide, what am I gonna do with this? Um, uh, Poe, AKA Sonicrats, window thoughts for day. Feelings are like fire. They can either warm you or burn you. Yours is the choice. Caring, compassion, courage, and kindness are the fires that ignite each other. One candle's fire can light 10,000 and never lose its glow. Wood burns itself when it burns another. Now we choose. We don't fight evil by doing less evil. We fight evil by doing more good. And that's what our clinic did. That's what the people we served did. Our neighborhood pulled together. This is right outside. This is the Saturday after um, the first week of riots. And during that time, pretty much every grocery and pharmacy within our neighborhood was destroyed. But our, our people still needed, they still needed resources, they still needed care. And within our parking lot, um, a bunch of community organizations got together and they set up a resource where people could get groceries and medications and diapers, formula, and we were there. Our residents were there, our med students were there, our staff was there, our faculty was there because we knew we were there to serve and whether the building was gonna be open or not, we had an obligation to our neighborhood and we wanted to make sure our patients and the people we cared for had access to what they needed. And it was amazing. Everyone pulled together and we understood that what we were dealing with now was a revealed wound that was very deep in American society. When you look at where those riots and protests came from, they came out of the idea that structural racism is a deep wound in American society. And we're physicians, we understand that very often a deep wound can't heal unless it's been debrided down to the vital tissue. Structural racism needed to change because there's no way we could handle both a pandemic crisis and deny that people were suffering from long-term ills. Working with media again, and as you can tell, I, had my, I have my pandemic hair on at this point.
point doing interviews were all by Zoom. And this was actually a, one of our local, our public TV did a entire series on the idea that COVID-19 and structural uh, racism had actually gone from two epidemics to a syndemic. The ability for two epidemics to synergistically reinforce each other unless we took precautions to address that. Working with government organizations, working with our community, this is actually the governor and um, Senator Klobuchar visiting our neighborhood and talking to the folks in our clinic. And we wanted to make sure that we knew that people understood that we felt this was more than just a virus we were dealing with. And we were gonna be as physicians who believe that health begins where you live, learn, work, and play. If we're gonna talk about the social determinants of health, we're also gonna understand that structural racism impacts every one of those, where you live, where you learn, how you work, and how you play. And we were gonna address that. Our residents and our med students basically led the way. And they said, we're going to care for our patients in the deepest way possible in the exam rooms and in the streets because these things can't be ignored. There were folks who were like, let's deal with this after. You can't deal with this after because this is a critical part of how you can care for people. You can't tell folks, just pretend it didn't happen because that's not gonna allow us to heal. That's not gonna allow us to change. And one of the most amazing innovations I think that's gonna come out of this pandemic crisis is that we are normalizing deconstructing structural racism. We're normalizing being anti-racist. We're normalizing a physician's duty to care for their society by interacting with the places that we are greatly challenged. And that's a lot about conversation. Leading in this time, a lot of it is about getting people to have the conversations. As a leader, we can't fix all these things by ourselves. And we can't pretend to know all the answers. We have to engage in the conversations. And conversations around race in America are very uncomfortable. One of the things I try to teach my learners and myself repeatedly is that it's so often that the places we need to go to make a difference are uncomfortable. You can actually think of discomfort as a signpost towards healing. Many different organizations involved in our different leadership levels all engaging with this conversation. And this is the thing. One of the big issues, whenever there's a Q&A, there's always someone that asks like, I don't feel like what I'm doing is make a difference. I, you know, how can I make a change? One of the first things I talk to folks about is the first place you need to address is yourself. Who are you? What are you thinking? What are your values? How have you benefited? How have you, how have you ignored? How can you, what are you willing to do to help change the structures that you've benefited from? Having those conversations are critical. These are issues that people have been working on for decades. We're not going to solve them overnight, but we're never going to solve them if leadership doesn't engage. We're never going to solve it if we try to hide from the fact that this is a critical time. And in critical times, innovation can take leaps and bounds ahead of where we used to be. Medicine has changed more in the last six months than it has in the last 10 years. The idea of engaging with structural racism has changed more in the last three months than it has in the last 15 years. You have to understand, during the times of crisis is when we innovate and we're not gonna be perfect, but we have to try. Activating people is a lot about also allowing them to be gentle on themselves and having us be gentle on ourselves. I'm not going to be perfect today. I'll wake up in the daytime and I say, what am I going to do for my members today? And I'm not going to be perfect today. And that's going to be okay. But we have to engage. This is one of my favorite motivation. This is one of the things that drives me. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You're not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. And I think that that's one of the most critical things we have to think right now. As leaders, we have to acknowledge what's going on. We have to add, activate the people that have the ability to make the difference. 
and we have to advise as the person who also knows what the vision and what the mission is. And our advice is going to help people stay on that. We are not the experts, but we're going to listen, we're going to process and make guidance based on that. And we're not going to fix everything right now. Be gentle on yourself. That is critical. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief because this is 2020 and it's taking a long time and we don't know when it's going to end, but we have to be there for each other. Climate change, wildfires. And one of the things that I point out to folks is as much as they're concerned about rioters and looters and the damage, one gender reveal party did more damage than all of the Black Lives Matters um, protests so far. 93% of Black Lives Matters protests have been peaceful. The vast majority of folks who are doing the protest are doing social distancing and the vast majority, over 80%, are masking. We have so many challenges. When we're talking about, you know it's a crisis if you, if you can see it from space. That is a quote from one of my Harvard Kennedy School professors. These are the wildfires that were going uh, five days ago. There's, some of them may be contained, a lot of them are not. Woke up two days ago in Minnesota and saw one of the most beautiful sunrises. And it was clear that one of the reasons it was looking like that was because of the smoke. And I can't even imagine, based on where we live, the folks in the Western regions are having it so much worse. Folks in uh, San Francisco woke up to orange skies. With all those kinds of things going on, it's easy to want to put your head in your sand and just forget about it and just, you know, but we can't. We have to keep moving forward. The only way out is through, and the only way through is together. And leadership is a big part of helping us be together. So this is one of the things that guides me very, very, very much. Quote from Arthur, Arthur Ashe, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And I sort of wish that it was like a shampoo bottle. Repeat, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And for us, we kept working with organizations. We're still working with organizations. We've distributed now, I think, 6,000 masks among um, the folks that we care for. And we're continuing to be a part of our community. We're continuing to look for ways to help our community because it's not a sprint, it's not a marathon. It is an ultra marathon. And leaders who are able to acknowledge, activate and advise are going to be an important part of helping us walk this path together. So kindness, compassion, caring, community, courage. These are the things I try to hold in my heart. These are things I profess. These are the things I try to teach. And these are the, the, the stories that I try to engage with and amplify because they inspire me and they give me hope. Um, this is my son, when he was, I want to say, seven years old, we were at the Martin Luther King Jr. Monument. And I said, go over, and I want to take a picture of you. And I didn't tell him where to stand, but I've always been touched by the fact that the quote is, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And it's always touched me that he stood under only love. Because I think the universe wanted to remind me that that's critical. So this is where we are now. Um, I'm no, I am the immediate past president of the Minnesota Family, of family Physicians. Um, still working as board chair and engaging in policy. Our current president is Dr. Andrew Slattingen and he's carrying on doing a great job and he'll bring his own uh, flavor to our mission. Uh, this was a fundraiser that we did based on 
an idea from one of our members. He heard a quote I said during one of the um, broadcasts and we decided to make outreach with it. And now we have these t-shirts and masks and the idea being that we want to continue to engage with our communities visibly. And the way we are often backing each other up is wearing a mask is a way of saying, I appreciate you, I care for you, I want our community to survive. So contact spreads virus, mask spreads love. Leading in crisis. Acknowledge, activate, advise, repeat as necessary. This is what I do. And I'm always trying to change and learn and innovate. And the biggest thing that I've learned is that as a leader, I want to be a catalyst. Catalyst doesn't change what's already there. It just helps what's there work more efficiently and more effectively. And the people I get to work with I'm deeply honored, are amazing, innovative, thoughtful, and they care. And we're trying to spread that throughout our communities because serving is a critical part of leading and compassion, caring, community, and courage are the ways that we want to engage with it. So thank you all very much. I appreciate the opportunity and honor to present to you, and I hope that this has been helpful in some way.